Every few years, a rescue story captures worldwide attention. An individual or a group is trapped with time running out. People watch and pray as a desperate attempt is made to save them in time. You might remember one of these stories, October 14th, 1987. Sissy McClure left her 18-month-old daughter, Jessica, in her sister's yard playing with some neighborhood children while she went to answer the phone. Moments later, when she came back, she saw several of the children looking down a hole in the ground. Jessica had fallen 22 feet down inside an abandoned residential water well that had been covered by a flower pot. Somehow the children moved that flower pot and Jessica fell. For the next 58 hours, rescuers worked frantically to dig a parallel hole in the hard Texas soil, breaking dozens of drill bits. At one point, Jessica fell another six or eight feet deeper. Thousands of journalists and TV cameras descended on Midland, Texas. And for two and a half days, America held its breath. Watching, waiting, hoping. Some of you remember where you were. Remember watching, hoping, praying that one little baby girl trapped in a well would be rescued. In April of 2008, Chris Cardello went to Alaska to ski fresh powder in the backcountry. He was having an amazing day of skiing when all of a sudden a band of snow above him broke loose in an avalanche. Chris was wearing a helmet cam that captured the moment. Chris fell 1,500 feet in 20 seconds and was buried in the snow. Crushed by the weight of the snow, trapped and alone, Chris struggled to take his final breaths. In Thailand, Saturday, June 23, 2018, a group of boys between the ages of 11 and 15 from a local junior soccer team and their 25-year-old assistant coach went missing after setting out to explore a cave. The team was stranded in the tunnels by sudden, continuous rainfall. Around 7 o'clock, the head coach had about 20 missed calls from parents worried that their children had not come home. He dialed the assistant coach and a number of the boys, but no one answered. Eventually, he reached a 13-year-old member of the team who mentioned he was picked up after practice, but that the rest of the boys had gone exploring in the caves. The coach raced the caves found abandoned bicycles and bags near the entrance. With water seeping out of the muddy pathway, he alerted authorities to the missing group. And desperate authorities to locate the group were hindered by rising water levels, currents. For a week, no one knew if they survived. The cave at rescue effort quickly grew into a massive effort with teams from multiple countries trying to find the boys. Being trapped is many people's greatest fear. Some people freak out if they have to have an MRI. Can you imagine being stuck in a well for two and a half days? Or under feet of snow? Or trapped in a cave for two and a half weeks? Now, thank God, most of us will never have to live through that. But you still know what it is to be trapped, to be stuck with no way out. When you're trapped, you're somewhere you don't want to be or in a circumstance you don't want to be in, but you feel powerless to change your situation. You may be trapped in a relationship you never should have been in. And now you're in so deep you can't see a way out. You wonder how and why you got into the relationship in the first place. You know you should end it, but you can't figure out how. You may be trapped by mountains of debt. 
You never planned on getting this far behind. Now it's hard to imagine being free. Your future is uncertain and you're consumed with fear. Will you lose your home? Will you ever be able to pay off the credit cards? Will you ever be able to achieve your financial dreams and goals? Others are trapped in addiction. It started with one drink at a party, one hit on a joint, a cigarette to look cool or fit in. And now you can't seem to function or exist without it. You've tried to quit and can't. You feel trapped. Sure, this will be with you forever. Maybe your addiction is hidden. You're addicted to pornography. It's harming your marriage. It's destroying your self-worth. You've spent countless hours in front of the computer, hundreds of dollars feeding your addiction. You want to quit, but you can't. You're trapped. So many things can trap you in a spiral of defeat and despair. You may be trapped by guilt. You messed up. Your past is ugly and dirty. You wish you could go back and change it, but you can't. There are moments when you feel okay, but guilt and shame is an overwhelming issue in your life. It has you trapped, unable to move forward. Or you may be trapped in unforgiveness. You think you're getting over the hurt and pain, but when you see that person again, or when you read something online, the feelings come rushing back, and you wonder if you'll ever be free of that. It's a hopeless, helpless, desperate feeling. When there doesn't seem to be a way out, and you can't move forward. It feels like there's no way to escape on your own. You need to be rescued. And the greatest trap of all is sin. Sin is when you violate God's instructions in his word. Sin is choosing your plan for your life instead of God's plan for your life. Jesus said, anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead end life and is in fact a slave who can't come and go at will. There's no way to get free on your own. You try, but nothing works. You search for answers anywhere and everywhere. Oprah, Google, YouTube, self-help books, meditations, programs, all kinds of different things. The problem with your attempt to escape is the same you who got into the trap is now trying to get you out of the trap. And when you try to escape on your own, you only get more trapped. The more you try to figure out an answer, the more you're trapped. It's like quicksand. The more you struggle, the deeper you sink. And finally, one day, you learn to accept the trap you're unable to escape. And then that trap becomes part of you. It becomes your identity. And you say things like, I'll always be an alcoholic. It will never change. There's no hope. It's useless to try. Guess I must have done something to deserve this. I'm just an addict. I can't quit. I can't stop. I'll just have to learn how to live with it. I'll learn how to manage it. There's no escape for me. Healthy relationships, they're just not for people like me. Or I'm just a terrible money manager. I'll never be free. Dead end statements from a dead end life trapped in sin. You can't escape from sin on your own. You need a rescuer. And I have good news for you. There is a rescuer. Paul wrote about that rescue. Pick it up in verse 6. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. The early church was growing. People were hearing about the good news of Jesus and his resurrection. They were making the decision to follow him. And just as the church was growing then, it is today. Now, although church attendance in America is declining, in the rest of the world, the church of Jesus Christ is growing and strong. In 1900, there were approximately 600 million Christians. Today, there are 2.38 billion followers of Jesus in our world. You're not alone. The number of evangelicals in our world has increased from 112 million in 1970 to 386 million in 2020. In 1900, more than half the world's population was unevangelized. They'd never heard about Jesus. In 2020, that percentage has dropped to 28.3%. Yes. 
Over the past 100 years, Christians grew from less than 10% of Africa's population to nearly 500 million believers on the continent today. One out of four Christians in the world is presently in Africa. Asia's Christian population is 350 million and expected to grow to 460 million by 2025. Good things are happening. Good things are happening around the world. And it's not just overseas. When we started Hope Church in Helena, West Helena, there was just a small handful of people there. Last week, there were 85 people at Hope Church. That's a miracle. When Station Church in Hornell joined us, there were 14 people on the first Sunday, and that included the pastor's family. Last week, there were 60 people at our church in Hornell. We started an online church in Saudi Arabia, reaching out to Muslims. And this year alone, we have baptized over 20 new followers of Jesus in Saudi Arabia. In fact, I want to read you a report from Pastor Dick Brogdon, our pastor there. He said, we rejoice at what God is doing in Saudi. A lady Jennifer is discipling reported to us this week, she now has five believing family members, two uncles, two sisters, and her brother, four of whom she led to the Lord. One of these sisters was saved after being healed. She'd been unable to have children for 28 years, but the believer prayed for her in Jesus' name, and she became pregnant. A few weeks ago, she was afraid to witness. Now she's boldly proclaiming. Her one uncle was in prison for his faith. When we gathered to pray for him, he was released from prison the very next morning. He said, we know there will always be attacks against the church, yet we rejoice that our Lord Jesus never loses a fight. Amen. Amen. A missionary from our church is ministering to Somali people in the Horn of Africa. This was his recent update. I met with a local Somali guy, originally from Hargeisa. We sensed he was seeking, so this week we had him over to my friend's house where we had a four-hour conversation about Jesus. The first two and a half hours were full of typical Muslim debate, and we thought the conversation was going to end there. My friend prayed. We shifted the conversation for a moment. But then the guy asked, what does it mean to be baptized? We were thrown off, but started talking about it. Then he said, I love Jesus, and I follow him. Because of the original conversation where he was arguing his point of view, we suggested we read together some of Jesus' statements about these topics and then decide if he believes what Jesus is saying and wants to follow him. We sense the spiritual tug of war, the pull towards what he knows, and the emptiness he's feeling in his heart, saying there's more to who Jesus is, and he's chasing after that. We're excited to start studying and praying the Lord reveals himself fully to him. Be praying with us that the Lord will be speaking to him and seeds planted will bear fruit. His name is David. Listen to me. It's time we quit hanging our heads and acting like losers. God's church is growing. Good things are happening. People are coming to the Lord. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. Paul said, it's not just happening around the world. It's happening with you. God is working all around you. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. The people in Colossae learned about God's grace because a guy named Epaphras shared. Epaphras is not a famous Bible character. There's not a book of the Bible named after him. If there was, we'd all have to learn to pronounce his name. <laughs> we don't have any great stories about him. In fact, he's only mentioned three times. Here in verse 7, again in chapter 4, where Paul tells the church that Epaphras is praying for them, and then in Philemon chapter 1, where we discover that Epaphras was in prison for his faith. Church tradition tells us that Epaphras later returned to Colossae, where he was killed for his faith, but those details are not in the Bible. You've probably never thought about Epaphras, 
but he's the guy who took the gospel to Colossae and planted the church. One faithful, obedient guy made a difference. I think one of our missionaries, Kenton Moody, is a modern-day Epiphras. Kenton is not flashy or famous, but you rem might remember him from an offering we took earlier this year. Kenton went to Santa Ana, El Salvador, and started a church. He found a piece of property between the 18th Street gang and MS-13 territory that no one wanted to buy because they feared the gangs would kill them. Kenton built a church on that spot where the gangs once fought. The church began with a few people. Now they have multiple services, hundreds of people attend. In addition to the church, there's a free medical clinic. There's a feeding program that provides hundreds of meals. There's job training. In an area known for killing hate and anger has been transformed and rescued from evil. Now it's a place of healing and restoration. One church planted has turned into thousands of lives turned around. Pastor Jay Martin went to the one, one of the most crime-ridden neighborhoods in Little Rock with a basketball, and Metro Worship Center was born. One person really can make a difference. God wants to use you to be a difference maker, to rescue people from sin, and to introduce them to his glorious grace. Last year, many of you generously and sacrificially gave in an offering for Project Rescue. Because of COVID, Women and children were being released by their traffickers, but they had no way to earn money. They needed job training, a place to live, food and medical care. And you responded with the biggest offering in the history of our church, over $350,000. And a few weeks ago, I got pictures from our training center where we're teaching the women to farm and to raise livestock. It's, it's a beautiful example of what happens when we partner, someone else is willing to share, someone else is willing to go, and together we're making a difference. Hundreds of women are being trained and employed because you gave. You made a difference for them. Pastor Rajneesh sent this update about one of the women. He said Natu was sold to sex slavery at the age of 17. For almost 23 years, she was exploited and abused and lived a horrible life. Then the COVID crisis came. The, during the first 70 day lockdown, she had no money, no support, but the forever free project that you funded brought her an opportunity for freedom. She showed up, she asked for help and a job. She was weak and in bad shape. We provided her with care, comfort, and an opportunity to live her life safe, secure, respectfully, and with joy. She's now one of the permanent staff members at the project and is living a life of joy, self-respect, and happiness. When you leave today, you'll be given an annual report from Project Rescue because in two weeks, we're taking an offering for an exciting new project. Many of you have already received a letter from me about it. I wanted you to be able to read and see the updates for yourself because I don't have time to share them all. I also want you to see how your money is stewarded. I want you to know where the money goes and, and how it's watched over. Paul said, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, We've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through his spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul said, the first day we heard about you, we started praying for you. We have a responsibility to share and we have a responsibility to pray. You may never go to El Salvador, Saudi Arabia, but you can pray for the church there. You can pray for churches in Afghanistan and Iran and Syria just a few weeks ago because of your missions giving uh, we were able to open the assemblies of God in Syria An incredible incredible miracle of what's going on I can't wait to tell you about it later uh, Burkina Faso you can pray for the church in Cuba and the church in Spain you can pray for the church in Helena West Helena and in Little Rock and in Hornell New York Paul continued, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father 
who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. What a beautiful prayer. Now, here's how you can personalize that prayer and pray it for your church, your kids, your grandkids, your coworkers, and new followers of Jesus. I just, I just kind of wrote it out in, in personal language. I pray you'll live a life that pleases God in every way and that demonstrates his love to others. I pray you will continue to know God and know about him. May the strength and power of God fill you so you don't give up or give in. I pray you will stand strong in faith, face hardship with joy and thanksgiving because God has set you free and rescued you by his grace. And then Paul continued with the reason why we can be joyful and thankful. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, I love that Paul didn't say God has rescued you from the dimension of, dominion of darkness. He said God has rescued us. He said, I was in the same place you were in. I was trapped in sin and darkness until Jesus set me free. And now because of his great love, you and me, we are forgiven and we are free. See, the only difference between you and the person you share Jesus with is that you've already been rescued and they still need rescue. And because we have been rescued, we're driven to share with those who are still trapped in sin. That's the essence of gospel. That's what missions is all about, rescuing people from darkness and introducing them to the love of Jesus. The whole nation watched baby Jessica trapped in the well. And finally, after 58 hours, paramedic Robert O'Donnell wriggled into the passageway, slathered baby Jessica with Vaseline, and slid her out into the bright television lights. The moment was famously captured in this Pulitzer Prize winning photograph by Scott Shaw. An entire nation celebrated because one baby was no longer trapped but free. Baby Jessica would never have escaped that well by herself. She needed a rescuer. Chris was buried for an agonizing four and a half minutes unable to move because of the weight of the snow, each breath taking more and more effort. He was doomed to die, trapped under the snowy avalanche. But Chris's guides were amazingly accurate in their search for him. They frantically began digging down, trying to save him, and his helmet camera captured the moment. <laughs> Chris couldn't escape on his own. He needed a rescuer. His only hope was a rescuer. July 2nd, British divers found the boys from the soccer team alive on an elevated rock two and a half miles into the cave. But they were still trapped. The next monsoon rains were expected to start on July 11th. Finally, after days of pumping water out of the cave, rescue teams made their way to the boys. The British divers made their first exploratory dive on Wednesday, June 27th, four days after the boys went missing. The challenge was immediately obvious. Water the color of cold coffee, almost no visibility. Swimming against a torrent of water, the engorged stream that runs through the cave. The divers were able to lay down a crucial guide rope. And on the seventh day of diving, on Monday, July the 2nd, they found the boys perched on a rocky ledge and were met by an unforgettable chorus of little voices. How, how many of you? 13. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. What, what, day? what day is it, the boys ask? Monday. Monday. You have been here? Ten days. Ten days. The rescue effort involved more than 10,000 people. It included more than 100 divers, 
representatives from 100 governmental agencies, 900 police officers, 2,000 soldiers, 10 police helicopters, seven ambulances, and more than 700 diving cylinders of oxygen. And the world celebrated the rescue. Those boys couldn't get out by themselves. What they needed was a rescuer. When someone who's been trapped in sin is rescued by the love of Jesus, that's not featured on the news. There aren't big crowds here. There aren't thousands watching. The world doesn't celebrate, but heaven does. Jesus said there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, we don't know what that rejoicing and what that celebration looks like. We can only imagine. But the celebration of heaven and angels has to be far greater than any celebration on earth. Thank God we have a rescuer. I don't know what situation has you trapped, but I have a word for you today. Listen to me. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness that brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He has rescued us. Imagine a lifeguard pushing a rescue tube towards you. And all you have to be do to be rescued is to grab onto that tube. He has already rescued you. Now all you have to do is take hold of that rescue and accept that and accept the price he paid and accept that forgiveness. You are not trapped forever. You are not stuck forever. You don't have to be an alcoholic forever and you don't have to be an addict forever because he has rescued you out of darkness. He has rescued you and he has set you free. And if if you feel stuck today, you feel stuck in a relationship You feel stuck under a mountain of debt. You feel stuck in a habit. I want you to know that the reason Jesus left heaven and came to earth and the reason he died on a cross was to be your rescuer so you can be free. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. And if you say, Pastor Rod, I need a rescuer today. Maybe you are trapped in addiction. Maybe maybe you're just buried in guilt and shame. Or maybe, maybe you've just, you're so stuck in sin, you say, I just need to accept the forgiveness. Regardless of what it is, if you need a rescuer, I want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand? I'm just going to pray for you right where you're at today. But I want to pray for you if you're stuck and you need rescue. Boy, there's a whole lot of us in this room that need a rescue today. How many believe that God can just do that right now?